Good evening and welcome to the Crucible Theatre, Sheffield. For the past 40 years, it's been a theatre defined by its name, The Crucible. The home of Snooker's World Championship. A sedate sport, superheated in this city of steel. Apply heat in a confined, intimate space and there will be sparks. What a fantastic maximum. The toughest, taken to the point of meltdown. It's hard to describe the claustrophobia of that little arena and all of the history. I have a seemingly personal connection with this place. My father passed away uh, this year, uh, just before the World Championships. I still played in it. He was with me from the start, so I thought, finish this time now. It was so very special to me, and here I am in Sheffield again. Yep, it's me, without the queue. Not playing, but looking back. What is it about this place? Steve Davis, the world snooker champion. Once you get serious about snooker, it's where you want to play, isn't it? The best moments in snooker have all been at the Crucible. It's such a special venue and the atmosphere in there, it sort of gives you goosebumps. It's the shrine of snooker. The tales of the Crucible are not told in a rush. These are crafted stories, chapter after chapter, stories within stories. Oh, wonderful! Sad stories. Jimmy, who's been there three times before, will be the saddest person in Sheffield. You want sad? Here we go, then. He's done it! I'll have company. The Crucible and Snooker are all about being out there on your own. But we are a family, a gathering in a landmark year. Happy 40th anniversary of the Crucible. I've been coming here for 37 years, nearly the time the Crucible's been here for the World Championship. There's been some marvellous moments for me over the years, six times world champion, obviously, and it's the pinnacle for a snooker player to play in this venue. But it can also be your worst nightmare. Imagine a trip to the dentists, your first driving test, and possibly your first job interview, all rolled into one. It is one of the great sporting arenas. It's there with Wimbledon, with Augusta for the Masters, you know, Yankee Stadium. You, you choose your, your one of... There's a kind of mecca, cathedral, you know, use all the clichés of its sport. It is the one. I can't think of any other sport it would really work for, but it really, for somehow, for snooker, it just, it's just perfect. When you're the player and you're a young lad, that's where you, you should aspire to play. And it's like going to Wembley and you've got your football boots. It's exactly the same for the Crucible. If you've got a queue, that's where you need to be. The World Championship comes to Sheffield in the spring and it brings television with it, part of the process of transformation. A small theatre about to go global with those stories. Slow in the telling, but colourful. Snooker is all about colour but not as seen in the days of Joe Davis. No relation. Joe won the first 15 World Championships and then brother Fred took over with eight. You can't blame anyone called Davis for making snooker a bit dull, but it was a bit gray, a bit in black and white, until late in the 1960s, when the sport found itself a new champion. The great Sir David Attenborough was the very first controller of, of BBC Two, and one of his great decisions to use colour was snooker. We're going to have snooker. It's anthropologically fascinating to see these weird creatures bending down, pushing sticks. No one quite knows why they do it. Snooker's colour was back, and it had a voice too. Whispering Ted Lowe, who devised a new show. Perhaps this is the moment I should remind you that we have £100 for a break of up to 99 Pop Black was the sport's new shop window. The one-frame dash, Snooker's T20. But what about the long-form World Championship? Well, it had its new stars, like Ray Reardon, six times world champion. But something was missing. It didn't have the buzz, you know, like the glare, the, all the pizzazz. It didn't have that. It was really lacking something. We went to Australia twice. We went up to the Newcastle and Manchester area. It didn't have a home. The show without a stage. It had a backer, blimey, tobacco sponsorship. The BBC were keen and it had a promoter, Mike Watterson, 
who in 1977 set about finding that elusive ingredient, a place to call home. I just thought I'd bring that to show Oh, blow it. Oh, we got there. Yeah, that's 1977. That's the very first time. Oh, I never played in it that year. It's funny how it, uh, how it came to be here in the first place. The fact that snooker is at the crucible, in one respect, is to do with your wife. Yeah, well, she was going to this uh, play here with her friend. And she came back, she said, I've just seen a, a, a cracking venue for, for snooker. What was the play? I can't remember, Steve, you know. It, it's important. It was... uh, no, uh, <laughs> my memory is as well, but it's not <laughs> that far back. And I said, well, well, I'll have a look at it. And I came to the crucible, had a look. I walked on into the auditorium and I went, wow, perfect. I said, how wide is the stage? And I'll come to the stage manager. He said, it's 36 feet. Perfect. Six feet of legroom, six feet of table, six feet of legroom, and so on. And uh, he said it was designed by a famous Shakespearean actor that started at one end of the stage and he made this speech as he walked to the other side of the stage. That's where it had to finish. And it was exactly 36 feet. So it was Providence. John Spencer takes the world crown for the third time. And the world champion 1977 receiving his check for £6,000 and promoter Mike Watterson offering the congratulations as we say goodbye from the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield. That gave me a hell of a buzz and I still get a terrific buzz when I walk in here. It's a great place. And so began the age of the Crucible. 40 years and counting, offering its stage to the stars. Everyone has a favourite. Ronnie, Ronnie. I was absolutely sucked in by the 1980 uh, win of Cliff Thorburn over Alec Higgins. The fluid, God-given talent, the artistry against the learned, schooled, disciplined, technical player. From that moment onwards, from 1980, that became the, if you want to give it a grand name, the dialectic of snooker. It's very difficult uh, to play in front of Alex Higgins' uh, home crowd. You're a fantastic audience, and I just hope that uh, you stick with him because he's the biggest draw in the game of snooker today. Chalk and cheese, and room for them both. I remember perfectly sort of the, the, the golden era of, of, of the main players when they were household names. Alex Higgins was the hero in our house, and Jimmy White, when Jimmy White came along, they, they seemed to be the kids from the wrong side of the tracks. Oh! oh. <laughs> was that good? Do you like that? <laughs> they looked like they'd just come out of a snooker hall, straight into the finals, into the championship. Obviously, Alex Higgins has moved into this position of, of super, super legend, but he was the smoke and, you know, drink man of snooker. He was... <laughs> Like that, drink, drink, drink. The most fascinating. Yeah, you know, orange and vodka going down his face, and then he would come up and do these remarkable things, and people loved him for it because it's as if he kept snooker honest. He kept one foot in the smoky club. Still enough points on the table for Alex if he can just take his opportunity. And that's a tremendous shot under pressure. A lot of courage Alex has got. The Higgins break against Jimmy White, every shot he played was totally unconventional. You know, there's no way that the purists would ever recommend anybody playing shots like that. And Alex was just hitting them in the centre of the pockets and he kept putting himself in unbelievably hard positions and getting out and, and cleaning up. Oh, marvellous! And the audience go mad. What a finish. He promised his baby daughter, Lauren, he'd win at the Crucible. This of hers for good luck. It wasn't quite the style of Ray Reardon going for his seventh title. It was another final of contrasts. Just three balls to go now for a break of 135. Ray Reardon has sat in his chair for the whole of this final frame. Fantastic. Standing ovation throughout the thousand people here at the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield. Hurricane Higgins, after ten years, has regained the title.
the tears and the baby, wasn't it? No, he didn't know whether to hold the trophy or the baby, I don't think. Was, and I don't know which one meant more. The moment when he was going, ooh, and summoning down this baby. Now, I reckon here mm -hmm. was exactly where you were brought into your dad's arms. I know, he won't be able to lift me up now, would he? No, I, and, I, and I, I could, but I'm not going to. Cause that <laughs> it looks very different. I know, it probably does. I think I remember all the lights, obviously, because it's full of lights, isn't it? And yeah. the audience and the noise. I think as well it blurs into my memory because I've seen it so many times on television. Yeah. It's a special moment for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it brings back a lot of memories being it. Your dad was a fantastic competitor. He had like fire coming out of every mm. pore. And I used to be quite scared of him. He was quite animalistic around the table. He was very much showing the aggressions like you could see his nostrils yeah. flaring out and yeah. everything and the other thing was when when all of a sudden things were going right and he got a fluke he'd be grinning at the crowd i love it yeah i was just really playing up to it yeah. yeah i know i might be a bit biased but i think my dad made snooker what it is and i think a lot of people um wouldn't be where they were today because he made it interesting exciting and i think that's undeniable uh, really. totally undeniable during the 70s when the game was right in the doldrums, it was him that dragged it out. People identified with him. He was the cavalier player. I think he probably would have won a lot more matches if it hadn't been for the fact that he liked to please the crowd. Yeah. And that's what he liked to do. He was a character, wasn't he? Oh, totally a character. And a true standing ovation. It was a lot more colourful because of my dad. Totally. Yeah. Totally. I had some of the most amazing matches against him. Yeah. Are you upset? Yeah, a little bit. Oh, don't be upset. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, is, it is sad that he's not here, yeah. especially with it being the 40 years. Yeah, it'd have been lovely. Um, yeah. It would have been nice. He could have had a lovely time. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. he'd have enjoyed it now. Yeah. I like so, to remember him working out I like out to remember the, when he tilts his cap and he throws it. Yeah. And he, and he winks and he says, come on, babes. <laughs> so, Fantastic. Yeah. And so it grew. The theatre within the theatre. Its annual cast of characters, new faces in the lineup, new storylines, the quest for the Crucible's first maximum break. I had a dream that I, uh, that I made a 147. I didn't think anything of it then. And then I fluked the first red. <laughs> Terry went, you know, like that kind of a thing. Can you imagine being there to see the very first one at the Crucible? It must have been a wondrous, wondrous experience for those who saw it. I wasn't um, at home watching it on television. I was in the Crucible. And I was at, kind of at the back of the auditorium and we were watching it starting to think, this actually might happen. The break had begun with a fluked red, the story's first twist. But now Cliff took a turn for the worse. I wasn't feeling well, I just, uh, oh, I, I slept for about an hour the night before. I felt awful. Like my nose was running, I had to actually stop. I have a little break here. <laughs> well, what a, what a sensible fellow. At a stage like this with just one red left. Oh, what a moment this is. It is truly electric here. Every bone in your body's willing them to do it, you know. And you're up cheering. You're cheering at the television and it's just wonderful to watch it. I just felt like I was, uh, you know, just right there. And you could see the other players coming from the other match. They stopped it to peer around because they got wind of what was going on. Who was it that walked around? Yes, it was Bill Werbeneck. I um, can't remember the other player, but it was definitely Bill Werbeneck because he's kind of unforgettable. Bill Werbeneck st uh, stuck his head around the corner there and I'm going to myself, oh, not now, Bill, come on now. You know, it's like this one. And Bill Werbeneck. As tense as he is. When I was shooting the black, I said to myself, well, we're just going to make this one straight in. It's not even going to touch the sides of the pocket. It's an amazing moment of breaking that standard BBC code of, you know, impartiality. And they went down with the cue and it's like, good luck, mate. Oh, good luck, mate.
yeah. <laughs> and I, oh my God, oh my God, I was, you know. And that, he gives, it's, you know, he was all man. Terry Griffiths, who's got a job in his hands, walks out pretending to smile, yeah, to, right. just to get out of the room. <laughs> 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 I was very happy for him. <laughs> you get fantastic drama at the World Championship, you really do, and it's hard to describe the claustrophobia of that little arena and all of the history. Some of the great moments in, in television history have been made there. I mean, you know, the, the Black Ball final. <laughs> The Black Ball Final, 1985. Dennis Taylor against, well, as they say, I was there. That was one of the great television events, wasn't it? It, it looks totally different, doesn't it? Yeah. We were involved in something that was iconic, mm. that a third of the population back in the day watched on TV and had to go to work the next morning yeah, yeah. and and couldn't turn their TVs off. Steve Davis, not well liked in our house. He denied too many of our heroes championships in the past. Dennis Taylor himself, I think there was that thing of we were definitely willing him. Somebody had to come along because, because Steve Davis just seemed unstoppable. No one beat Davis. No one beat him. He was not beatable. Well, I was a cert to win that final, I know that. Uh, <coughs> well, you certainly uh, were at 7-0 uh, and 8-0. Now, well, Steve Davis, he's really riding on the crest of a wave at the moment. Everybody forgets, Dennis Taylor was 8-0 down in that final. And he came back and he won, what, seven of the next eight in the second session. All of a sudden, my wheel fell off. I collapsed by the end of the night, 9-7. Six frames in a row, marvellous performance by Dennis Taylor to narrow the gap to only two frames. That spirit that he showed in the second session was what got us in the end to the Black Ball final. And Dennis Taylor, a very satisfied Irishman, sits there with the frames all square, 17 each. It was a big night for... I think for all of us, it was agonising. It really was a big deal. It sounds crazy, but it was a big thing. And we were in this room <laughs> with 900 fans who, who were chewing their nails, not knowing what was happening outside in the real world and how many people were watching. I think it was something like 18.5 million people. I mean, that's the kind of audience you get for a World Cup final or something. And it was in the early hours of the morning, it just gripped the nation. Nobody ever dreamt it was going to go down to the black. So we didn't know how to handle the pressure. Even you that had won it the two previous years. Proper cliffhanger stuff. To go down to the very last black ball in a competition like that. The pressure on us both was incredible. I mean, we couldn't get a ball in the pocket in that last frame. Certainly going through his mind that he turned the light to play the double. And I tried to double the black. And the crowd all started cheering and I thought, it's in. Yeah! I had chances, Dennis had chances. That was the biggest shot of his life. I reckon it's about here, the corner pocket. Which corner? Oh, the, the, the top... What do you mean, which corner pocket? From the commentary box, the top left corner pocket, yeah. I'd say the black was, was about there. I've never asked you this question. Did you think I was going to pot it? Definitely, because when I seen it finish, I went back and I remember pushing my old upside-down glasses way up and I thought, there's no way Steve will miss this. No. <laughs> this is really unbelievable. I came to the table thinking, how have I got this chance? My one overriding memory is when Dennis Taylor knocks it in and he gets the cue, doesn't he? And it's not a very great celebration, but it's, it's kind of iconic. It's like something like that. Dennis Taylor, for the first time, becomes Embassy World Snooker Champion 1985. I don't think Dennis actually believes that he'd won it. 
and you needed to convince somebody to come up and say, Dennis, you've won this thing. Um, but the facials were just phenomenal. And then, you know, the nice little the sort of ah, ah, ah of, of, of Dennis Taylor was, it, it was a big night for, I think, for all of us. It was, it was a bit like the Rocky films, you know, the kind of, he can't be stopped, he can be stopped. A fabulous picture of a very happy and popular man. Steve, it's a, a pretty tough moment, this one, isn't it? Yes. Can you believe what's happened here tonight yet? Yeah, it happened in black and white. <laughs> Worst day of my life. Uh, have you got over day. that yet, Steve? Well, not really, but, I mean, yeah, I've come to terms with it. I reckon about 40 years I'll be over it. Uh, truly over it. To beat Steve Davis, who's been the best player in the world, well, you know, there's not a lot more you can say, really. Uh... Well, I'm the best this year. <laughs> The ginger magician and the fellow with the funny upside down glasses, we were involved in the best of the lot. Yeah. The Rack Pack, directed by Brian Welsh. A film made about snooker in the 1980s. The golden age, they say. I'm in it. That's me on the left. Or rather, the actor who played me. Here's the real me. Breathing heavily as he comes down to this final pink. And that's it. The World Snooker Champion, 1981, Steve Davis. And here's Will Merrick being me. Steve Davis, meet Steve Davis. Nice to see you. That seems right. I, I was worried you might be doing some sort of uh, acting role where you didn't look like me anymore. You had a black I've been beard trying to get away from you now for a couple of years. Oh, dear. Yeah. What's the first person who came up to you and went, uh, you look like? I had a dinner lady at school. Someone said to me, oh, she's calling you Steve Davis, you look like the snooker player, Steve Davis. He's tall, red head, sort of lanky, like a rake. Yeah, we should have a game. Yeah? Fancy a game? Yeah. That's aggressive. That's aggressive as well. I did want to ask you, when I was watching your footage of the crucible, when I'm playing pool and I'm getting closer and closer to winning, I, I lose my head and I suddenly start missing shots that I'd never miss, you yeah. know? Yeah. I'm overthinking it. Yeah. Did you, do you well, feel those nerves and do you worry that you're going to prang out as it...? Yeah, but, but I think if you're lucky, you stay in the moment and you don't look too far ahead or back. Mm. As if yeah. you've got an empty head other than that one thing you've got to do. And the Crucible, because of its nature of being so small as a snooker venue and very tight, and the, only 900 people but like a library atmosphere, mm. the Crucible is where people unravel more so than the other event. And down for the black. And oh. in the circle. <laughs> <laughs> My granddad would be... So proud. When you think about the Crucible, it's 17 days on red alert. You're just on tenterhooks all the time, knowing that you've won it. The emotion starts welling up inside you. And of course, the other thing is when I lose the final, the 85 final, mm. on the last ball, yeah. I walk to the table with the possibility to win it, and with the, everybody's ooing and ahhing in the crowd, and you're, you're on tenterhooks because they're in tenterhooks, and everybody in the room is absolutely transfixed by it. If I pot it, what happens? I win it. Yeah. And that's my, that would have been my fourth. Got to give them a couple, though, haven't you? That's Make what everybody fair. told me, but and I hated those words. <laughs> I hated <laughs> <laughs> I did manage to make amends for losing the final in 1985. I won three more world titles that decade. Life was good for me and my manager and friend, Barry Hearn. Look at him on his mobile. You could back then. We go way back. Today, Barry runs World Snooker. He's done all right, hasn't he? Morning. Morning. How are you doing? All right. Obligatory handshake. Right. <laughs> Congratulations there to the Embassy World Champion, Steve Davis, from his manager, Barry Hearn. The young man, just 23 years of age, coming from Plunstead, London, is now the Embassy World Champion 1981.
What a prophetic image that was. <laughs> Barry Hearn bursting into the arena and, and embracing you in a way that completely almost crushed your ribs. And, and, and it's a fabulous image. And who was to know that Barry Hearn would then go on to run and some might say rescue uh, snooker for the, for the 21st century? You know, when people say, I've always wanted to see the Taj Mahal, I want to see the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, to me, I wanted to be at the Crucible with my mate who was going to absolutely smash everybody up. <laughs> Leading up to the Crucible, you know, 81, it wasn't just about you winning the World Championships for me. It justified me in a strange way, you know? We beat and the we, world. We beat, beat the world. Just from Romford. And it, it, and, and it was so, yeah, yeah. it was a personal thing. That was the one day of my life yeah, yeah. that was the most exciting. I know I'm an excitable person. I have never felt things going through my body that I felt in 81. I mean, it's not the greatest work of art I've ever seen. No, not at all. It's but not the that. the characters yeah. are in there. Look, look I mean, Mike Mark Watterson, Watson. who started The Crucible. And Yates. And Yates. Bill Werbley. And then the Reardons and the Spencers. And when we talk about characters, it's a schoolyard there. Not in that picture is another of the Sheffield characters, one of the cast at The Crucible, John Airy, a super fan, I suppose we call him. 81 was the first year, so this is the 36th year. There's some dodgy pictures, if you go on YouTube, of a 14-year-old kid with a bull head haircut and dodgy flares jumping up and down. I mean, yeah, we've been coming every year since. You know, there's probably 30, 40 people have been coming for donkey's years. You, you know, you build relationships and everybody likes snooker. That's the common bond and you can sit down there and you watch the snooker and then you chat in the pub after with a pint. It's a nice relaxing holiday. I remember the Crucible as many wonderful things, but never as a holiday resort. The same people go there every year, practically. And not only do they go there every year, they sit in the same seat. Can you believe it? Can you believe... Booking your holidays for a week at the Crucible, there's something wrong with these people. They weren't looking at, you know. They should consult somebody. It's ridiculous. And I used to be nice to tell the George, Bill, Fred, nice to see you back this year, have a good tournament. I was asking them to have a good tournament. And they said, nice to see you again, Ray. <laughs> it's different here, isn't it? Yeah, I think there's a few things going for it. One, which I think is often overlooked in snooker venues, the acoustics help. Yeah. In here, it's like playing in somebody's front room. Everything's soft and cushioned, and the balls click nicely. How many sessions a tournament do you watch here? Well, I guess it's, what, 17 days times three, so 50-odd. Um, Gee whiz. The morning sessions are the trickiest ones. You've got to be here for 10 a.m., and actually, you've had paracetamol for breakfast. And you can't fall asleep in the front row, because you look like a real mug then. Some sessions are slower than others, but a new story is never far away. Take the Bradford crooner, who'd never won a match at the Crucible. Now, Joe Johnson is the kind of story, this is why I love snooker. We all used to cheer for our Welsh snooker players, and when Terry was drawn against this bloke we'd never, ever heard of, Joe Johnson, we were thinking, that's it, Terry's through. In the corridors backstage, which is usually adorned with pictures on the walls of the players, that's right. and then all of the press cuttings. Yep. Back in 1986, you became more featured in the press as the tournament unfolded. Yeah, I think that had something to do with the singing with the band, you know. It's great for me because, you know, the focus came on to me and I, I seemed to handle it pretty good. It was nice to be the focus instead of you. <laughs> <laughs> but then you did one of the best comebacks that we'd seen. He was playing Terry Griffiths on this table and he was 12-9 down. I'd never beaten him as well. He'd given me some real good ideas, Terry. Any time he wanted to beat me, he could beat me. You could see Jewel thought he'd lost. Terry marching on a bit here. He missed a green off the spot, and we'll talk about one shot changing a game. Well, that changed my destiny. He completely relaxed and he just started swinging. What a performance this is by Joe Johnson. How do you combat this sort of snooker? A quite remarkable match. He was playing natural, you know, club snooker where he wasn't worried about anything. And it nicked me 300 quid, so I was happy. Fast forward to the final. 
who was he I played? I've forgotten who it was. He totally destroyed me. <laughs> For me, a completely different feeling to the, the year before I'd lost to Dennis. Yeah. I yeah. just went, hands up, I've been outplayed. You absolutely flew. Joe is a terrific player and uh, probably his greatest attribute uh, coming through this world championship is his cool, calm and collected manner at the table. I was playing total relaxed snooker and you were probably under pressure yeah. back from losing the year before. You know, you may have had something in your mind that, I don't mean this disrespectfully, but I, I think you probably thought I was an easy touch. But I always knew how good you were. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but you, 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 you must have fancied it. You know, you must have done. Just 17 days ago, he was a rank outsider. The crowd here at the Crucible are going mad for Bradford's Joe Johnson. The most remarkable world final I've ever seen. It was a win for the underdog and everybody was cheering for him. You know, it's not that they didn't want Steve to win, it's that they generally, uh, and it's the way the British public are normally, they generally want the underdog to win and, and it was just a, a fabulous performance. That's one of the things I love about snooker. I love looking at that last 32, thinking, is there someone here? Is there a Joe Johnson who's going to come through and is going to get through to the final? Or, you know, maybe a new star is born. You still get the excitement when you come to the Crucible? Oh, I love coming to the Crucible. And, you know, I come here every year and it's brilliant to walk back in. But it's tinged with sadness because we're not going to play it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> Steve's going to do some trick shots. A couple of trick shots. Two trick shots. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. This may not work in the end, but it looks fantastic, right? If I get four, I'm happy. Five's very, very good. Six is the miracle one. Retirement from the game comes to us all. I announced mine at the Crucible in 2016, but was delighted to stay part of the BBC team. Shawbiz. Staying warm at the Crucible. It's the other side of superheated sport in Sheffield. Ask Hazel. It's a greenhouse, remember. It might look beautiful, but it's very cold. It is the world's second longest annual sporting event behind the Tour de France. You kind of go through something every April, don't you? <laughs> and come out the other end of it after a crucible campaign. Well, the slave drivers that work us and drive us into the ground. They're actually all laughing in our ear now. Steve buys his own chocolate for and he doesn't offer anyone else one. <laughs> That's the sort of people you're dealing with. He's a, he's a coffee snob. I had my run in the 1980s, and then this bloke took over. World champion seven times in the 1990s. It wasn't as if we hadn't seen him coming. The under-16 champion from Fife in Scotland making his TV debut, Stephen Hendry. <laughs> Stephen came into the picture, and of course, when a Scotsman is playing at the Crucible, you're rushing back from training to watch him play, and you know, and um, it was a fantastic time. I think. Many people thought before Stephen Hendry came along that Steve Davis owned the Crucible, and then came this young, fresh-faced Scott, who exuded a winning mentality, probably like we've never seen and will never see again. Henry had the potting thing, it, it, just like the magnificent brake building of the, you know, the same cue accident that, 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 that hit the ball. He made snooker look uh, like it was being played on a three by six bar box table. I mean, he just never missed. He was 16 years old when he turned professional. He was 21 when he won his first world championship in 1990, the youngest ever. He ruled the 90s. He was still only 30 when he won his seventh title in 1999. It's a strange old thing trying to analyse why we stopped. Do you think after all these years you still love the game? Not in exactly the same way, but it's in your blood. I know what you mean. It's, I mean, it's what we're best at, isn't it, snooker? Yeah. So I don't think it ever leaves you, and I think I'll always be involved in the game, because basically it's all I know. I love the game, also. I loved it more when I was playing on Sunday nights, but um, I still enjoy it. You all of a sudden said, well, now that I'm not winning, I'm going to retire. Mm. Whereas I went, 
I'm, I'm losing, but yeah. I still love the game, so I'm going to carry on playing even if I don't win. Yeah. There's two different mentalities from two of the biggest winners in the game. Yeah, for you, for, for me, it's different. There's, okay. love, there's loving the game and, and, and there's, in, there's enjoying what you get out of it. And, and uh, although I love the game, when you took away the winning, which was the ultimate for me, you took away the, the sort of um, the desire. Perhaps it's a lot easier when you're young. This is Stephen at 17 at his first crucible when it's all in front of you. I get to the crucible, I'm, I'm drawn against Willie Thorne. And I'm thinking, you know, just don't disgrace yourself. Don't lose 10 0 or 10 1 on live TV. Lost the match 10 8, got that, that sort of famous, nice applause from him going out, which I look back on now, I just think, oh God, I want to punch him. <laughs> but uh, but he, he, didn't, he didn't mean it like uh, sarcastic. He, he was I mean, just relieved. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, probably, yes. Uh, I think I'll, I'll win it in the next five years. I always just love being playing there. Um, I think a lot of players, you sort of hear moaning, oh, it's too long, and then they get to the semi-finals, they get beat, oh, I'm tired, it's too, I'm, I'm drained, and complete nonsense. I just, I just loved it. I mean, you just, even if you have like four matches go to final frame, I think you're, you're at the World Championship, you're at the Crucible, you still get yourself up for the final somehow. And with that break of 71, Stephen Hendry brings a great championship to an end. He has beaten Jimmy White by 18 frames to 12 to become the youngest ever champion. To some degree, you broke millions of snooker fans' hearts on many occasions because you did more damage in the finals of the World Championship to Jimmy White than I did. Was there any part of you that felt a bit sorry for Jimmy? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> when interviewed, he realised he was brutal as a competitive animal. He was a more clinical yeah. animal than I was even yeah. back then. Yeah. Uh, and any suggestion of a social moment or something that might be fun, uh, he said, no, why do that? Why do that? No, yeah. It's winning. It's only winning. And you think, oh, all right. <laughs> and of course it worked. My goodness, it worked for him. And maybe if Jimmy had had a tenth of that in other players, he, he might have just had that. Jimmy was doing other stuff. Jimmy White would be my favourite player. I mean, what a story. Got to be the best player never to have been world champion. So many finals, so many near misses. It just never quite happened for him. Six Crucible finals, five consecutive Crucible finals, four finals at the Crucible against Stephen Hendry, and he's in the record books at losing them. And it was heartbreaking. I mean, really heartbreaking. I won six finals. Jimmy lost six. He must get fed up with the amount of times people are saying the same old questions about you know, the, the World Championship and all that. But I mean, like, you had the roller coaster at it. Yeah, you know, I'm obviously quite proud of being in the six finals, yeah. but... Do you know what? I don't remember the matches I win. No. Do you, do you only remember the matches you've lost? Well, you obviously remember the ones you lost. A couple of the finals, I weren't quite there with uh, Hendry. Well, I don't know how I got to the final. 92, he's in his fourth final. We've seen him lose three times already. He's lost to Davis, Parrott, lost to Hendry already, of course. Um, and he's 14-8 up, Jimmy. And listen, at 14-8 up, you're world champion. I mean, you're, you're world champion. You know you are. You know you're spending your winnings. And this has been a fabulous clearance. <laughs> Jimmy White cleared up brilliantly. 14-8 up with Hendry yeah. and... Um, in my corner thinking, oh, I thank him, he helped me. I won't thank him, no, he I didn't help. I know, and I should have just rolled up, snookered him, but, you know. And that's why he's the number one in the world. Wonderful shot. All of a sudden, it's 14-12, and, like, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't have parted him if there was in a line-up, but you lose focus. His mind must be on the three previous finals he's been in, too. I won ten frames in a row to beat him. And there is a rather sad picture. Jimmy will be the saddest person in Sheffield. What does that do to you? I mean, how do you take that? How do you compute that? He must have been sitting there thinking all sorts of things. He becomes the 1992 Embassy World Champion for the second time. I think the nation wanted Jimmy White. Please, Jimmy, Jimmy, please win a Crucible final. <laughs> White to Britain. Then 94, of course, you go to a final frame. That's his sixth, you know, and Hendry has now beaten him in three finals. You don't lose six, you lose five times, 
and then you win. Then you beat the bad guy. Okay, we all know it. Uh, 17 all. I think Hendry's in the balls, then Jimmy White is in. Stephen Hendry, 24. And you know what? He's on his, he's on his way. Well, just look at the scores. 17 frames each. 24 points each. What a shot he's taking on. I thought he was going to win. I was in my chair and I wouldn't have had many supporters in the audience when I was playing Jimmy, but I had two or three in the balcony there and I sort of looked up and said, well, that's it. I'm not winning this one. He puts this brilliant blue into the middle pocket and you're thinking, he's on a roll. He's about to be crowned world champion. Everyone at home is thinking, here we go, finally. You know, he's not even close. He is not even close on that black. I had a great winning um, chance there. I think I rushed the black, obviously under extreme pressure. As soon as the black, I seen the black wobbling, I just shot out of my chair. He's cool as mustard. Perhaps because I'd resigned myself to defeat, but I was so relaxed in that clearance. I look back at it now and I think, God, you, you must have been absolutely shaken and, and under sober. But I swear, I was so relaxed. And you're thinking to yourself, Jimmy White's not coming back to the table. Jimmy White has lost another world title. Not many people could take that, you know. Most people would not be able to take, mentally, what Jimmy has been through. Stephen Henry has proved once again that he's the best player in the world. It's heartbreaking when you watch his speech afterwards, um, you know, because he's such a good loser, he's such a class act. What can I say apart from happy birthday? <laughs> He's beginning to annoy me. <laughs> I'm obviously quite proud of being in six finals, yeah. but the way I was progressing in a lifestyle, I might have been dead, you know, so... Really? Yeah, so I got to sort of say... I mean, is it true? Were you, were you like, partying in between matches? You know, like you are now with this DJ stuff, you know, when you're giving <laughs> it boom, boom all night. There's <laughs> some of that going on. It was either gambling, or part, you know, I'm not proud of it, but there's nothing I can do about it. But listen, I'm 54, and realistically, you know, I can't win the world championships, but, you know, I start, I'm still enjoying it. I enjoy practicing. So got... why I'm still enjoying it, I still believe I can win. Oh, listen, oh, it's yeah. been a pleasure yeah. as Thank always, mate. Thank you. Cheers. Keep rocking and rolling. Thank you. Terrific. <laughs> Getting inside the head of any snooker player. Well, it's a gift, and nobody does it better than this man. Psychiatrist and professor and doctor Steve Peters. Steve, hello. How are you doing? All right. Nice to see you. You're getting used to this place. You know your way around all of a yeah, sudden. I'm sure yeah, I'm a roomie now. I know you should. Yeah, this is. Yeah, I'm, I'm in dressing room 12 today. I've, I've okay. got problems with my interviewing technique. I'm under pressure a bit, so perhaps you can help me. Right. Right. Not a problem. <laughs> not a problem. Actually, it's not me. We need to talk about Ronnie. Ronnie O'Sullivan. It seems to me this is the only place where the players could truly unravel. The Crucible has a specific challenge, even within snooker. It was surprising when I first started getting into what Ronnie was doing. I had to get him to explain to me the nuances of the sport so I see how he's perceiving them. And then one thing he mentioned with the Crucible was, when it comes towards the worlds, I've got to get my endurance on my feet. He says, you're not used to it, you do short frames, so here he has to build up with, with practices and on his feet much longer times in order to get that endurance. I think perhaps one of the great things that Ronnie can do is he's able to play quickly and naturally and take his brain a bit out of gear. And that must be, at the crucible, more of an advantage, I think, than anything. It is, and once he gets into this floor, his confidence level for the next shot goes up and up. My job is to say, well, let's get that confidence regardless. Don't rely on getting into the floor on a good shot. If it goes wrong and wrong and wrong, learn to deal with that and still have the confidence to know it's going to happen. Most of them are perfectionists. They see anything less than winning as, I failed, and that's a shame because actually anything is good once you've got here, but winning isn't what you want. It's a test of expertise <laughs> to marry the long-form game with a short fuse the least conventional of his generation, our Ronnie. You have to go and see a psychologist. Oh, I've tried through them. I know all the right answers for that. 
<laughs> well, Steve Peters put you oh, right. Oh, no, I've seen so many psychiatrists, psychiatrists, I know exactly what to say. <laughs> I'll be fine with that. It's so much of a buzz, and it turned up to the World Championship. Is it, though, Steve? 17 oh, days? Did you, did you feel... I, I find it a lot of stress and pressure. I find when I'm playing, it's fine, but it's just the waiting around. I just think... Oh, yeah, it God, is, yeah. Like... Well, you have to wait around for those just odd just moments of that, panic. You get that fleeting moment where you win it and you're in the zone and you're flying. And don't get me wrong, that's an amazing yeah, yeah, feeling. Yeah, yeah. But 17 days of it, you're like... You it's, a, it's, a your yeah, it's a war yeah, of attrition. Yeah, it's a war of attrition, yeah. 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 I mean, I've been 16, 8 up in the semis thinking, this could go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, like, hey, that's not a nice feeling. I don't know, it's just the crucible. I think it just that does it to you, doesn't it? In some ways, he's overcome the mistrust of the marathon. In many ways. Five times world champion, but let's face it, it really should have been six, seven, eight, nine, ten times world champion. He's a great character to have in the game. He absolutely comes down from that lineage of Higgins, White, O'Sullivan. He's more talented than anyone in that lineage, is the truth. Here we have somebody who has personality, who has sporting genius, also wows crowds like I've never seen. He's an absolute one-off. You know, he's the sort of person that makes people who don't watch your sport watch your sport. There is no better sight in world sport for me than seeing Ronnie O'Sullivan clearing up. The one record that will literally never be beaten, and you can take it from me, it won't be, is 5 minutes 20 seconds by Ronnie O'Sullivan. Maximum break. Probably the most extraordinary feat anyone's ever achieved on a snooker table, I would say. Certainly televised. I think it's one of the most incredible things ever seen in sport, to be honest. One. It's artistic, it's creative, it's, it's clairvoyant, it's psychic. He's tuning in to higher energy without any shadow of a doubt. He's basically got the cue ball on a string. We're watching a magician at work. I'm starting to get a bit uh, excited here. It doesn't look hurried. He doesn't look as if he's trying to be really quick. He just made it look so easy, and that's what the greats do in any sport. Each shot by shot, look, make, he made it look easy, but the, the speed was um, phenomenal. Four five. minutes for the century. Amazing. Right, this is the key shot. Needs a good angle on this red to get on the black. He's got it just. 113. There are some bits where he stops and he looks and you think, oh, hurry up, you've got to break the record. And, you know, he, he, he does it in the, the time it takes. It's unbelievable. Perfect. Yes, absolutely perfect. 134. I don't believe this. Maximum break, that is. Ronnie O'Sullivan's delighted, the crowd's delighted. John Virgo, and I'm delighted. Five minutes for one unbelievable maximum break. What took him so long? You know, <laughs> incredible. Steve, come on. Five minutes, 20 seconds. And he dropped his chalk. And he dropped his chalk in the middle of it. Sensational. We were all there through television, and that's the magic of the Crucible, because we were there, as David Vine and others have said throughout the years, welcome to the best seat in the house. That's where I am now, the X, watching the best, but somehow still closely connected, living every shot, glued to every camera shot. When I started watching snooker, it was literally one camera, possibly two cameras, possibly three. Now, you've got cameras in pockets, you've got a camera looking down on the players as well. I think we should say good evening and welcome to each of our cameramen, because although it looks easy, and although they are supposed to be anonymous by the very nature of what they're doing, without them, nothing gets broadcast. Let's say good evening. In the corner, it's Daryl. And you watch the dance of the cameras, these amazingly experienced cameramen, and you think, my God, he's getting too close, but he knows. They, they've instinctively, I've spoken to them, they learn the body language of the players, so they know, oh, he's going to do another 
uh, turn around the table, so I'll stay back. We say, all right, he's just going to stay on that side of the table, so I'll go in. You know, they have to predict that so they're not kind of breaking the concentration. They're fully aware that although their first job is to get the pictures to the public, almost equal first is they mustn't break the concentration of the player. Now these computer graphics that uh, give you the exact position at lower down and, and map the balls so accurately. How they do that, I don't know. That's what he's faced with there. It's just extraordinary how it's evolved from one, possibly two cameras, a whispering Ted Lowe, to this all singing, all dancing box of tricks that we now have at our disposal. Right. right. I hate you. And I tell you, you sit in my seat, right, and I'll be, the <laughs> I'll be the presenter. I've always wanted Ooh, a bit of presenter. This is a bit of a change. I, I know. Oh, reversal. I'm feeling the pressure already. <laughs> you've seen so much stuff at the Crucible, but obviously you missed the '90s effectively. Mm. But you've seen the modern day era unfold. I've witnessed so many amazing things. I do remember that the first World Championship we did together was 2002, and that was Ebden's year. Yeah. And it was Ebden against Hendry, 1817 in the final. I thought they were all like that. <laughs> Much of the drama of the Crucible is about ripping up convention, like being known as the Hurricane or the Rocket. And then there's Peter Ebden, who moves at a slower pace. So the Peter Ebden, Stephen Hendry final, possibly the tensest final since 1985. The one thing we know about Peter Ebden, and I can speak from personal experience here, Sometimes we go very late into the night when Peter is playing. <laughs> and I say that in the kindest possible sense, Peter. And it went late on, and Stephen Hendry has a chance to make it eight world titles. When I think of Stephen, and I've said it before, I liken Stephen to the biggest, baddest, meanest great white shark there's ever been. Because he was absolutely ruthless. <laughs> Really, when I should have won 18-16, um, I missed the black off the spot that I thought was in. Oh, dear, dear, dear. How's he missed that? It was just refocus, um, you know, getting the disappointment out of my mind of losing the previous frame, and um, yeah, just put in everything into it. You know, I, I, I think back to that World Championship and it really was like wringing a sponge. A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, right, a little bit more, come on, a little bit more. And that's what it was like, you know, everything that I am, I gave. Stephen Hendry, he's now got to sit there and wonder how many he's going to be behind when he gets back to the table. If he gets back to the table. I probably made one of the best breaks under pressure in my entire career. What a moment in the life of Peter Ebden. Everything he's worked for, dreamt of, will become a reality. Pop this or not. It's over! Seven times world champion Stephen Hendry claps his hand and says, well done, Peter Ebden. You are the embassy champion of the world. Hendry devastated, no one likes seeing that. If you look back at my face, yeah, I was, I was way shocked. That still sends shivers down my spine thinking about that. It was just the satisfaction of knowing that you've beaten the most successful player of all time. Lovely. Family and friends there, and my daughter Clarissa was there at the end and held her up, and yeah, it sends a, a chill down my spine thinking about it now. The theatre, the stage and the set, built with infinite care, any special pressure on the world championship tables, you're putting them up. Do you feel the heat? Do you feel the Oh god, you feel the massive pressure, yeah, you know, because it's, it's so much coverage and you know the whole world's looking at it, you know, and it's I know there's a lot going on at World Championship, but at the end of the day it comes down to those um, big green things in the middle of the floor, you know, and you've, you've immense amount of pressure. It's not good for us because it's tiny. From one side of the set to the table's only five foot four or 1.53 in new money. Four foot ten, isn't it? Average queue size, four foot ten. So only gives them six inches. It must hurt when all of a sudden you put your heart and soul into yeah. making the table to the best of your ability, mm -hmm. perfect. And then the player comes off and says, Rubbish. It's rubbish. <laughs> <He's on. laughs> what, what's he doing? <laughs> I've had that many times, you know, but. You know, and sometimes, you know, things go wrong, but, you know, the majority of the time, it's out of your control. 
it's atmosphere, heating, too hot, you know, but the plane conditions now, uh, you just can't, you, you cannot do any more, you know. We're almost up to date and ready to start again, which brings us to the reigning world champion. And here's one of those snooker stories within a story. And here comes Leicester's world number one, Mark Selby! I did catch the final last year, although there was something on that was a little bit more important on that particular occasion. I was at home with my boys watching Leicester uh, win the Premier League title. I'm not sure I've mentioned it before. Final of the World Championship, Crucible Theatre, Mark Selby looking for his second, Ding looking for his first, doesn't get better than this. It's fascinating that you know Leicester were winning the title at the same time, and you know, he's a huge Leicester City fan, Mark Selby, and you know that can actually put you off, is the truth. You know, you're either thinking, am I going to be inspired by this because you know this incredible sporting thing has happened, or actually, am I going to take my eye off the ball? That's an excellent shot. I sort of at the interval, I said to my friend, what's the score with Leicester? And it was nil-nil at the time. It's a fabulous chance here. And it's there. Mark Selby, for the second time, lifts the world title and he becomes world champion for 2016. But it was only after I'd won, I'd come back to my seat and, and one of my friends who was, who was sat next to me in the crowd, he said to me that Tottenham had drew to all and, and, and Leicester were champion. So, that sort of made it even better. This is part two of a sporting double for your hometown. Yeah! So my big question is, are you going to let them share your open-top bus? <laughs> well, I didn't get one last time when I won it two years ago, so... Uh... <laughs> the joy afterwards as well, when he realised, I've got it all, we've done it all, the whole of Leicester is delighted. They found a king in their car park. You know, they'd won the league title and they'd won the world championship. I watched the end of it. To be honest, I'd had a few by that stage, so I might not remember it too well. The Leicester Sporting Double, all part of the global appeal of today. Prize money this year, nearly £2 million. The television audience keep adding the noughts. I think that last year, Ding Junhui uh, in the final attracted an audience in China of over 250 million people during the middle of the night watching his match. <laughs> I mean, the 18 quarter million... of a billion. And, and meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, players, players like Mark Williams have got have got Day Llewellyn's tractor fitter <laughs> stitched to their jacket. <laughs> He's going to get amazing hits on their website. It's going to <laughs> China gonna crash. A quarter of a billion people say, "Oh, what's what's this?" We need to find out. <laughs> I love that because for all its glamour, for all that Barry Hearn has brought to the game, it still has these wonderful little you know, <laughs> Pete. Widgins double glazing dot co dot uk written across the, <laughs> the whole of China. <laughs> we chuckle at our peril. This is the crucible with its heat that can keep each and every one of us, wherever we are, warmed by its glow. The dream of people now is to go to the crucible as a spectator, not as a player, to sample that atmosphere that is totally unique, that can't be replicated anywhere in the world on a sporting stage which evolves like reading a great book with twists and turns in each chapter until you get to the final page, you don't know who's won it. You're so close, it's so intense, there's an electricity that crackles in the place. You really feel you're sort of in the centre of the great web and every twitch on the filament is something that kind of comes back to you. It's, it's magnified. You are the 998 people around you. Yeah, you're there in the middle. And everyone's so quiet. And you can almost hear people whispering. People don't think you, you can hear them, but you can. It's too small. It's cramped. There's not enough room for the players, there's not enough room for television. There's lots of things that shouldn't be right about the place, but it just is. It sends a little shiver down your spine because it's got so much history attached to it. It's just pure theatre, it's drama. It's just a crucible, I think, it just that does it to you, doesn't it? On my tombstone will not be written, this is the man who took the World Championships away from the crucible. It's staying and it don't matter how much is involved and I have never said that once in my entire <laughs> life. <laughs> Great days mate. Great days. <laughs> That's a rat boys, yes? I have my time upon this stage, 
this small space, this compact arena, but massive. Stand by to be squeezed in again. Stand by to be transported wherever the crucible takes us. <laughs>